So, hey, friends, welcome back to this episode of the Maranatha Global Bible Study, um, The Rapture and the Endurance of the Saints. So, as promised, we've now wrapped up essentially 40 sessions, um, working through all sorts of different passages and details concerning the rapture. Um, as most of you know, much of it was focused on um, addressing many of the arguments, uh, even the cliches and um, scriptural arguments, as well as even emotional uh, arguments and different things that are often attached to the pre-tribulational rapture. Um, behind all of it, uh, as those of you who have watched to know, my primary heart has not been to argue um, eschatological minutia. My heart has been to prepare the church to face the great challenges that are not just coming, but they're here. And yes, they're going to increase and get much worse. Uh, so as, as we've wrapped the series up, I tried to take a few sessions here just to work through uh, some of the strengths and some of the weaknesses of the pre-wrath and post-trib camp. As I've said for years, I sort of view myself as being somewhere in between the two. I think um, that's true if we're using these definitions in a very broad sense. Um, but I think if we're to be a little bit more technically accurate, I probably do fall into the post-tribulational camp. And interestingly enough, I, I have actually just sort of arrived at that conclusion after listening um, to one of my friend's podcasts, Alan Kirshner, who we will have on next week, um, listening to one of his podcasts where he lays out, he says, you have to believe all of these things in order to be pre-wrath. And I realized, well, I guess technically I'm not pre-wrath then. I'm technically um, post-trib, but I did um, want to honor Alan and give him some time as we wrap this up, just to chime in and sort of express um, perhaps some of, you know, some of the different arenas in which he disagrees, different passages that he may disagree with my interpretation. But I also wanted to uh, give some time for a post-tribulational voice. So I'm really blessed to be joined uh, this week. We're all blessed to be uh, joined with Pastor Joe Schimmel. So Pastor Joe, I actually spoke out at his church uh, in Simi Valley out in California. It's probably been a, a decade. Um, wow. When was your when was your um, film Left Behind or Led Astray uh, published? Yeah, uh, man, that was probably, yeah, about a decade ago, man. It, time's flying by. <laughs> time's flying by. Yeah. Be back with you again, though, brother. And I absolutely so i'm gonna i'm gonna introduce you real quick but i'm gonna have you introduce yourself as well so um he, joe is not just a pastor there um at uh, in simi valley he's also his ministry is called good fight ministries and he's put out a lot of um video teaching content and so forth over the years um a lot of produce a lot of videos um, but I'm going to actually let you jump in. Let me just say this in terms of his character. Joe is a man who has a passion for the truth, uh, for faithfulness, and he genuinely cares about God's people, which is sadly a, um, <laughs> we're seeing it less and less among pastors. We see people who are wanting to exalt themselves and their ministries over and above God's people. So I deeply appreciate, very much deep, deeply appreciate Joe's heart. So before you jump in, Joe, just tell the audience a little bit more about who you are in case they're not familiar. Yeah, uh, yeah, briefly, uh, pastor a church called Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley. Uh, and uh, we, you know, but Good Fight Ministries, you kind of pretty much covered that. Uh, done a lot of documentary films exposing what's going on in popular culture. From a biblical vantage point uh, some know me from they sold their souls for rock and roll others from other documentaries we've done uh but i uh, like you <laughs> i'm uh, also known not that i try to be known but known as a, a, a staunch you know um you know one who puts a lot of emphasis on being ready for the second coming and also not being bamboozled uh by a secret coming you know seven years before the second coming uh whereby the church is not prepared to face the antichrist and the coming persecution uh, so I've had a, several messages along those lines as well. And I've gone through the book of Revelation uh, two different times. First time for seven years, verse by verse. The second time about the same amount of time. So uh, like you, I just love prophecy. And I've always, um, when I've heard what you have said about biblical prophecy, Joel, I've always been incredibly blessed. And I uh, thought, well, praise God that the Lord's given him an understanding. And I'm glad you're out there because back in the day, you know, 
uh, before the internet, you know, we were, the post-tribs were, uh, you know, voices crying in the wilderness. Now through the internet, a lot of people are able to see scriptures instead of a, a, kind of a monolithic view of the time of the rapture. Yeah, absolutely. And as, as I just said, and as I've said many times, you know, um, a pretty significant percentage of those that are listening to my messages, my teaching, they're falling in either the post-tribulational or the pre-wrath camp. Um, so they believe, both together believe that we're going to face the Antichrist, face the Great Tribulation. Um, but there are some differences. And so that's the primary focus of our discussion today. And um, as much as I talk, I'm going to do my best not to talk and let you let you share. But let's just jump in. Um, so in some of my previous sessions, I discussed what I personally saw as the strengths and the weaknesses of both the pre-wrath and the post-trib camp. Probably the most significant for me personally, the most significant difficulty or challenge for the post-tribulational view is the fact that it really seems as though you have the rapture taking place in between the sixth and the seventh seal. Um, you have the specific reference to the cosmic signs um, you see those same cosmic signs there in Matthew 24 described as being after the tribulation, uh, verse 29, 30, and 31, and that seems to tie it in with the rapture. Um, and so if you view the seals, the trumpets, and the bulls as being um, consecutive, as opposed to sort of overlapping, then this becomes a challenge. So, you know, I sort of address that. Um, again, very briefly in previous sessions, but I want to I want to start right there, and and say as someone who has been post trib for a long time, very familiar with the pre wrath camp, how do you personally respond to or address that particular uh, issue? Yeah, and that's uh, important to understand uh, that issue. In fact, it's funny because uh, praise God, you know Alan Kirschner, who I know you're going to have on, uh, great brother. You know I've talked to him before. I debated Dr. Stoffer. Uh, in our so-called great rapture debate, which is free on YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. pre-tribber. And Alan and I had a uh, discussion before I, it, I actually made that debate or had that debate and went to the pre-trib camp there. And it was interesting because uh, after the debate, Alan gave, you know, high props to our defense of uh, that, that, you know, against the pre-trib rapture. So I love Alan, you know, and I love my pre-brath uh, brethren. I have a lot of them as well. And I totally understand how they can arrive at their viewpoint. So I, 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 they actually have some scriptures. It seems like they could use far more than I believe the pre-trip camp. So, uh, and Alan, I mentioned him because uh, I'd seen one of your episodes where Alan, uh, well, you quote Alan as saying, there's never been a post tribber that's been able to give a meaningful answer uh, to the sixth seal. Uh, and first I'd like to say that there's no clear scripture. There's no reference there specifically to the saints being caught up. At the sixth seal however as strange as it's going to sound i do believe the rapture does happen at the sixth seal i believe because it's concurrent i believe with uh you know jesus said in matthew chapter 24 verse 29 through 31 immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will not be dark and the moon will not give its light the powers of heaven shall be shaken and the stars will fall and so forth and they'll see the son of man come to uh, you know the, the tries of earth will mourn though i think that's important he says the tries of earth will mourn and they'll see the son of man coming in power and glory with his holy angels, right? And then he'll gather his elect up, right? And that's where the elect are gathered. The elect are definitely uh, include the church because in chapter 22, uh, a couple chapters earlier, Jesus talked about many are called, but few are chosen. And those called, uh, uh, and those chosen happen to be among those in the highways and byways after the Jews had rejected the gospel. He uses that, that same, you know, Greek word for chosen there. Uh, I'm, I'm already thinking pre trip dealing with my pre trip brethren here, you know. But it's interesting, uh, when you look at Matthew chapter 24, the tribes of the earth will mourn. And why are they mourning? Because they will see the Son of Man coming in power and great glory. It's not just to gather the saints. And that's the biggest problem I would have with my my uh, pre-wrath brothers, brethren's position, is they destroy the unity of the, the saints being delivered and the wicked being destroyed at his second coming. And when you go on, you see that it's the tribes of the earth that are mourning because they see the Son of Man coming in, in power and great glory. Do they see him and he just disappears, you know, for a year and a half or two years or what have you? And no, because the same coming Jesus goes on to talk about in verse 22, uh, 42 and 43, uh, he comes like a thief. And if they had known when he was coming, he wouldn't destroy them. 
So it's the second. So the unity we see throughout, you know, and 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 when you put when you go to the sixth seal, yeah, you are talking about the cosmic events, the same cosmic events. I believe that uh, that you're talking about in Matthew 24. But in Matthew 24, the coming has to do not with the it's just deliverance of the saints at the sixth seal or Matthew 24, but also has to do with you know Matthew chapter 25. Uh, Jesus, when he comes, there's a sheep and the goats. They're both dealt with in First Thessalonians chapter five when we're caught up to meet him in the air. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we, Joel, you and I, especially because you're warning the brothers and sisters, not just looking for Jesus, but you're looking with a sense of expectancy of looking at the signs that come first. We're not in darkness that that they should overtake us like a thief. Same kind of language as used in Matthew 24. But we're children of the light. We've already entered into this spiritual day. And uh, but we're not we're not children of the night. And uh, with, while they're saying peace and safety. Sudden destruction will come upon them. So the same rapture, the same coming that raptures us, brings sudden destruction upon the wicked. And then when he states right there uh, that we're not appointed to wrath, the context of that wrath, Joel, is the second coming wrath. The wrath that Jesus comes with at the second coming. So there's that unity again. And then when you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, you see Paul says, rest with us. You know, when the Lord, and when does the church get its rest? And I say this to my pre and my, my pre-trib and my pre-brath brethren, whom I love all of them, and it's a family debate, but we want to warn our brothers and sisters to be ready because many will be caught unaware. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, you know, he very clearly says, you know, rest with us. The church is going to get its rest when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, uh, you know, taking vengeance on those you know, who do not know the gospel of Jesus Christ, do not obey the gospel. On that day, he comes to be glorified in the saints. It's the same It's the same coming that the wicked are destroyed on and, and the saints are raptured. And then you go to 2 Thessalonians 2, right after that, if you just keep reading, there's no chapter breaks in the original. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says, concerning Christ's coming. And I think it's important that he, to point out the word there, he uses the word parousia, same word Jesus uses in Matthew 24 early on. Concerning Christ's parousia, his coming are being gathered together to him uh, and he warns, as you know, Joel, very well, and I'm sure you've dealt with that a lot in your series of a deception, either by letter as from us, which could be a counterfeit letter or somebody saying, hey, look, Paul talked about this preacher rapture or a spirit, a demon even, uh, or, you know, a, a prophetic word to think that that day has already come or come to be at hand. King James translates at hand. Uh, most have it as uh, has come. I've looked at the Greek uh, word, how it's used in the first and second century, and it is often used to come to be at hand, meaning imminent. And he put, says that day will not come unless what? The falling away takes place and the man of sins, the Antichrist sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he has got those two events have to happen first. But this is what's interesting. Yeah, those things will happen first. And I praise God for my pre wrath brethren that they're warning the flock that we will see the abomination of desolation, that the church will be persecuted by the Antichrist, and they are ready to be persecuted. And that's the most important thing I think about when we discuss this doctrine. So I praise God for that. But guess what? Back to the parousia, which won't happen until these two events happen, first the falling away and the Antichrist, which by the way, Joel, that's the same order Jesus gave. That'd be the falling away. Many would fall away, Jesus said. He that endures the end will be saved. And praise God for your, your emphasis on endurance because a lot of our post-trib brothers aren't emphasizing the importance of endurance. Those two doctrines are so important and they're both being overthrown in the church today. But when you look at Matthew 24, you have, uh, right? At, he says, many will fall away. And then in verse 15, you'll see the abomination, abomination of desolation. And he used the word you, you know, it's a plural pronoun you know and he's talking to peter james john and andrew according to mark 13 all the discourse so as you continue to work your way through that then you see after that you see the gathering of the elect and episodagoge the words that are used paul just brother when i was getting ready i didn't wasn't able to use this but i had almost a hundred different parallels between the Olivet discourse you know mark uh, 13 Matthew 24 luke 21 and paul in first and second thessalonians between the parallel they're definitely talking about the same coming but this is an important thing after those events, Jesus then says, or Paul then reveals in verse 8, then he says, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will destroy with the spirit of his mouth and the uh, appearance of his parousia. It's the same parousia that delivers the saints and gathers us up that destroys the Antichrist. It's the same thing. So you see this, and probably the clearest, I mean, these are all clear, I believe, but in Revelation 19, the bride is still there right before the second coming of Christ. At the end of the tribulation, at the end of the seventh week, uh, Daniel or Revelation 19, even our pre wrath brethren will say, yeah, this is the very end. But the problem is they have two last trumpets. They have like pre-tribs. They have some of the same problems, the two last trumpets, same, they have two last trumpets, and there's only one last trumpet. Uh, they have two last days, days in the context of that last day. They have 
two end of the ages, and they have two first resurrections. Because when Jesus comes back in Revelation 19, the bride is still there. In Revelation 18, he says, come out of Babylon, my people, lest you partake of her sins and her plagues. In Revelation 19, now she's ready to be uh, given white clothing that's bright and clean because her, 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 her Messiah is coming. Revelation 19, 11, just right after that, the bride's been made ready. Church is made ready. Revelation 19, he comes and he gathers them up. Uh, he, the, the armies of heaven, I believe, that's the dead in Christ rising first. The holy angels will be caught to meet them in the air. And then he defeats the Antichrist. And the false prophet, same thing. But then you also have Revelation 20, which shows the effect of what happened when he came. And it says, uh, you know, he saw those who refused to take the mark of the beast. And he saw those who uh, had, you know, uh, you know, been persecuted, killed for the word of God. And he gives like two or three groups there. You can parse the Greek into three groups there. But it's interesting. Uh, he says, they come to life. And he says, this is the first resurrection. Well, then now you have to say, well, really, it's not the first resurrection. There was a first resurrection way back here at the pre-wrath rapture, you know, a year and a half or two years, depending on how you mark it, uh, which it breaks this unity again of him coming to deliver the saints and destroy the wicked, kind of like what happened at the Red Sea. He delivers his people, you know, and then he destroys, uh, you know, Pharaoh's army. So when you put the scriptures of Matthew 24 with the sixth seal, and I'm, I'm in agreement. So what is going on there, though, is the question. What's happening at the sixth seal? Uh, it looks like so definitive that something really radical is happening. And that, that it's like, and some are probably wondering, my pre-wrath brethren are wondering, well, wait, you agree that the sixth seal is the end? Absolutely. Well, wait a minute. What about the seven trumpets and the seven bowls that come after that? And how you must be, how are you not pre-wrath? You're refuting pre-wrath. Well, the, the point is, is that every time you see the end of the book of Revelation, which is several times, uh, it's not chronologically an end. In fact, in Revelation 1, 7, it says, Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kings of the earth shall wail because of him. That's Matthew 24 as well. And they're, they're, they're wailing because of him. But nobody says Revelation 1, 7 is the second coming of Christ. Even pre-tribs can't even use that verse. They would love to use it, but they realize, oh, the tribes of the earth are mourning. This is the very end. Every eye is going to see him. And that fits with Jesus saying, Lightning would come from the east to the west. So a lot of times, uh, Joel, they'll say, they'll pick an, a picture of the end, a lot of my pre my pre rap brethren, they'll say, hey, this looks like the end, and it is the end. But they'll say, but everything that happens after this, because the book of Revelation is chronological, must take place after this. So this must be where the rapture takes place. The problem with that is, Joel, you, you're you probably really familiar with Revelation 14, when you have the two angels and one you know sweeps the sickle and he's on a cloud. And there's the, I believe that's the rapture. Then the one after that, right after the rapture, another angel, he sends his sickle, but you have the grapes of wrath. You have Armageddon, this whole picture of destruction between 15 and 20. Well, you and I, we just say that's Armageddon. A lot of a lot of uh, pre rathers would say, yeah, that's Armageddon. Well, guess what happens after that? The seven bowls happen after that in chapter 16. We would never say, well, now the bowls are going to take place and then bring us to Armageddon at the seventh bowl. What we would say is that's a picture of Armageddon, chapter 14, 15 through 20. But we'd say the seventh bowl is also a picture of the end. So now let's back up. And when we look at uh, and I'll slow down a little bit because this gets a little more complicated. And I feel like I talk a little fast because your audience is pretty up to speed because of you. So praise the Lord and the Lord using you. Uh, so I'll slow down a little bit now because this will be a little more complex and people really got to think this through. Is uh, is there's a lot of parallelism in, in scripture, in prophetic scripture. Uh, when you look at Genesis, the liberals will say, hey, look at Genesis chapter two. Is it, is it contradicts of Genesis chapter one. There's two gen There's two creation accounts. We say no. It's one creation account in chapter two gets more detail. The creation on the sixth day of the man. When you look at Daniel, and you've studied Daniel more than most people I know, Joel, and you know that a lot of people will take uh, the paralleling passages and they'll make them different things. But if you look at Daniel chapter two in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, you look at Daniel chapter seven, you know, and that's uh, Daniel's vision. Uh, they're talking about the same kingdoms. Uh, you're talking about, the, you know, the leopard and the lion and the bear and so forth. And and Daniel's and Daniel sees them as wild beasts. That's from God's perspective. And you, you look at uh, the perspective of Nebuchadnezzar, who's a king who thinks these kingdoms are great. He looks at them as gold and, and silver and so forth. But they represent the same kings. But there's parallelism. You go to the lamb later, you know, or the ram and the, the two horns. And there's a lot of parallelism throughout the book of Daniel. And that's how the Lord works. I mean, we've got the synoptic gospels, Matthew uh mark and luke but they all do the, the uh all the discourse but they give us different details 
Luke starts explaining the end that leads right to the end, but then he shows that Jesus says, before these things begin to come to pass, I mean, before the birth pains that lead right up to the Antichrist, this is going to take place. Then he gives us like 10 or 11 verses describing Jerusalem being encircled and what happened under Titus in 70 AD. Our, our preterist uh, friends, they will read that and they'll just read it as it's one event. And no, you got to pay attention. Jesus says, before these things begin to come to pass, which I believe is the interpretive key there, then he describes everything. That he means before the birth pains even start, which is the future, this is going to go down in Jerusalem. And then he goes back to the signs of the sun and the star of the moons, which picks up what he started with about the end times. And Luke doesn't give us all the details that Matthew and Mark do about the Antichrist kingdom, because Luke wrote the book of Acts, and he's focused more about the early church and what they would suffer under, under Titus, where Matthew and Mark are uh, concerned about us also knowing the end. So now when we look more closely at Revelation uh, chapter 6, and I'm just kind of setting the stage, uh, you, you're aware that when, <laughs> give you one more example, uh, which I think is a really good one, is in Genesis you know, Joseph is given a vision of seven skinny cows, but he's also given a vision of seven stalks of grain that have been stripped. Both those represent the same seven-year famine. You can't say, oh, there's going to be two seven-year famines, 14 years of famine, you know? No, uh, that's, that's, so this is that parallelism we talk about. So I've said all that to say, when you get to the sixth seal, uh, it's very, very important uh, for your audience to look carefully at that, that passage there. That passage is not about, you know, something that happens uh, long before Armageddon, because that passage describes something far worse than anything uh, that's seen before Armageddon and describes Armageddon. Uh, in fact, we don't we see in that passage that the kings of the earth and the mighty men, they they run to the hills, the mountains. It's kind of weird. It's reversed now. Now they're running the mountains and they're crying for the rocks to crush them, to hide themselves from the great day of the Lord's wrath. And it says their wrath because it says the wrath of him who sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. And it's the day of wrath. That's the day of the Lord. And Elijah comes before the day of the Lord. How do you have pre rathers have Elijah, Elijah coming later then, you know? Uh, this if That's the day of the Lord, you know? Uh, so this is the day of the Lord because it says, who will be able to stand? They're begging. They're crying out to Mother Nature, man, uh, to crush them. That's not happening even during the bowls, bowl judgments. In the bowl judgments, the fifth, sixth bowl, I mean, they're blaspheming God. Even at Armageddon. The Antichrist with the false prophet and the armies of the earth are standing at Megiddo to fight. And then in the Valley of Jehoshaphat to fight against, you know, Messiah. They're right. still got all this bravery, but it's not until they see him and every eye sees him and the tribes of the earth mourn that their hearts melt. And that's when they start taking off into the wilderness. And it's also interesting that he says, who will be able to stand uh, because uh, this, this mighty wrath. And that's what I believe Revelation chapter 7 comes in, is he's showing that, guess what? God's going to protect the Jews, his 144,000. Uh, uh, we already, Joel, have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. We don't need a seal on our forehead. We've already been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, with the, the, and I'll get back to the sixth seal in a minute. But just to, you know, just like there's a parenthetical statement here in chapter 7, I'll deal with that because I think it's beautiful. Uh, and it shows the saints from every nation, kindred, people, and tongue, uh, people that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And I think it's important for our pre-wrath brethren and our pre-trib brethren to recognize that the word Lamb is used of Jesus in the book of Revelation several times more than all the other books of the Bible put together. Because the book of Revelation, Pharaoh and, and, and Jambres and Janes, the two false prophets that served Pharaoh, a picture of the Antichrist, Egypt, a picture of the world. That was a picture of the end times. I'm sure, Joel, you're really familiar. A lot of the end time prophecies about you know when you look at the bowls and so forth they're depicted in picture form typology and what happened with moses and, and the plagues there and so we have this other uh we have this cosmic i mean this worldwide egypt situation going on now and they were saved by the blood of the passover lamb and that emphasis on the lamb is that's what my pre-trib and uh pre-wrath brothers need to recognize is that uh the the wrath that we're saved from is at the second coming when Christ comes, we're saved from that wrath when he comes. But the wrath that happens, there's two types of wrath. That there's the wrath of God's being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and righteousness of men right now. So right. The, the wrath of God that happens during the tribulation period. Every pre-rapture I know, every pre-tribber I know, Tim LaHaye, you know, uh, in his prophecy Bible, he states, you know, uh, and I, I think it was Thomas Ice that edited it. And there's a note there when you look at the mini apocalypse in Isaiah. You know, Isaiah 24, 25, and 26. And it talks about come into your rooms and your your rooms and hide yourselves until the day of wrath is past and my indignation passes over you. They point out in the Tim LaHaye 
left behind, you know, pre-trib study Bible, that God will protect his people from the wrath during the tribulation period. Okay, then why are you trying to scare people into being pre-trib, saying they'll suffer God's wrath, and that's the way we get out of it? Well, I say to my pre-wrath brethren, he's going to protect us from that wrath, and chapter 7 is all about how he's going to protect them from it, not how they're going to be raptured before they get into it. And we're not, there's no emphasis on us being, because, uh, you know, by the time you get to Revelation, God expects you to understand that Gentile believers have already been sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're already protected from the wrath. We're not a point of wrath. We know that. So back to six, and this becomes something really beautiful to me, Joel. And this, I memorized about half the book of Revelation going to working back before I became a pastor. Ironically, when I became a pastor, it was hard to memorize the second half and even keep the first half all memorized because you have to, it takes 45, 50 minutes for me to go through the first half to keep it memorized. And when I was doing that, the symmetry just blew me away. I remember reading around the time I was doing that, a, a university professor saying, who was teaching his kids the book of Revelation, his students, that John, he thinks, was on an acid trip. When you read the book of Revelation and you see the symmetry, it's so powerful. And the symmetry of the sixth seal with the seventh trumpet with the seventh bowl is breathtaking when you look at it. And by the way, this isn't a novel view. If you look at, uh, and and, and, I, and I'm gentle with my pre-wrath brethren, but if you look at Rosenthal's book, the subtitle was this new view, you know, and it, like pre-trib, it was a newer view, although I believe it has greater precedence than the pre-trib pre view because there were some speaking of this duration of, of wrath that was going on, uh, but not quite as elegantly as in, in specific as you see with the, the sixth seal being before the end. So it's interesting, though, is when you look at... Uh, the sixth seal, the seventh trumpet, and seventh bowl. The symmetry is amazing, but it's not a new view because the very first commentary on the book of Revelation is Victor Rhinus, and he's a uh, 200s uh, church father, you know, and uh, his commentary is a little choppy. He doesn't go every, through every verse, but he has a commentary. He definitely has the church in the tribulation because there was no pre-trib back then, right? Uh, but what's interesting, the main feature that he brings out is the parallelism between the seals uh, the trumpets and the bowls. And by parallelism, we're not saying that the first seal is the first trumpet is the first bowl. We're not saying they all happen exactly the same. What we're saying is that they overlap each other, kind of like the, the what we mentioned earlier about prophecy. There's these parallels. And I believe you can pinpoint, and it's, this is my opinion, and people need to check it out and see if it carries weight or not, you know. Uh, but uh, what I'm saying, I think, is really clear. But what my opinion is may not be as clear. It is, you know, I, I have a conviction about it, but I could be wrong. But when you look at the, uh, the, the and praise God, pre wrath has it right. Those, the, those first, uh, you know, those first seals that are being opened, they correspond so wonderfully with the, the discourse, you know, without enumerating them. And then when you get to the fifth seal, this is very, very important that we see what's going on here because it's God's people interacting with his judgments. And they're saying, they're seeing like the prophets of old, they're like, God, what are you waiting for kind of thing? And of course, his, he, his patience, we need to take his patience as salvation, uh, Peter says in Second Peter, and he tells them to be patient. And they say, how long, O oh God, until you avenge our, our blood on, this, uh, on the blood of our servant, you know, your servants, on those who dwell on the earth? I mean, they're just destroying us, which is a picture of how, and by the way, even Matthew 24 has this recapitulation, because Matthew 24 starts where you're going to be, you know, you be killed for my namesake and everything. Then when the abomination of desolation comes, then there will be great tribulation. That's when it kicks off. So that even recapitulates in, in a way. So it's interesting when you look at the prayer, and this is and this is where I'm going to slow down a little bit, is, uh, you know, in in chapter six of Revelation, we get the fifth seal. They're crying out, how long, O God, and to avenge our blood, you know, on those who dwell on the earth. And he's they're crying out, when's that vengeance going to come? Because, I mean, they're they're in the fourth and fifth seal now. And we have to imagine this, the, the, the scroll is a scroll that has seven seals. And when you get to the sixth seal, you got to imagine the seal opening up. When they get the sixth seal, the whole thing hasn't opened up yet. But you see the most you've seen now of that seal you're able to read. And there's that that there's that revelation. And I believe he gives two answers to that, that prayer, Joel. How long will you avenge our blood on those dwell on the earth? He gives them white robes. He says, wait a little while. And he says something very important. Wait a little while until your brethren suffer in the same way that you suffer. I mean, you're waiting for others. Just as it says, in Hebrews 11, the saints that have gone on before us, the Hall of Faith saints, that they will not be perfected without us. We're all waiting on something. And he's saying, wait till your brother been killed in the same way you are. What else are we waiting for? When well, the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the worlds, it's all the nations, and the end will come. And that'll come up in a minute when you put these things together. The symmetry is incredibly beautiful. And 
they, they're saying, how long? And he gives them two answers. First, he gives them the short answer. He gives them the, uh, the a, a clear definitive answer. I'm going to do this. And that's what the sixth seal is about. It's almost, Joel, if you're talking to you, and I know you love to witness to Jews, and I love that about you. And I'm like, I love to do that. I, I, I was planning on doing a prophecy video going to Israel. I'm supposed to be leaving in a few days, but we can't get in there now. You know, we had a whole team going, ironically, right? But it's interesting. You might give them the short answer. Hey, look, all Israel will be saved, you know? And look, they'll see the one whom they pierce, Zechariah 12, you know? Or And then you might say, and they'll say, oh, wow. But they will say, hey, wait a minute, but heavy things are going to happen. Jacob's trouble, you know, let me explain this to you, brother, or, or friend, as you're trying to bring him to Christ. So uh, what happens is the Lord gives him a picture of the end, as he does throughout the book of Revelation. He gives a picture. This is what the end looks like. But then you go to chapter 7, which is that parenthetical chapter, saying, look, I've got you guys taken care of. Because he's he's answering this prayer. They saying, hey, look, I'm taking care of the Jews, my people, and I'm taking care of the Gentiles who I've grafted in among them. And then he gets back to the answer again in chapter 8 after the parenthetical statement then you see the prayers of the saints going up before the altar that's the prayers that include chapter five and then he shows the longer answer where the where the, and i'm getting chills all over the place right now bro okay and that could just be me maybe it's not the holy spirit but man i'll be and that's not happen all the time and then you see chapter eight the first few verses you know you see the uh the longer answer where the prayers of the saints go up again i believe it's the same prayers and then you see the the bowl, the uh, the trumpets start to blow, right? And the longer answer, hey, these things are going to take place on the earth, you know? And what's fascinating about this uh, to me as well is when you look at the, as I mentioned, the cemetery, uh, he's he's very concerned that his people understand these events and and the timing. And 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 as you move through the, the uh, trumpet judgments now, one by one, they go to the seventh trumpet. And what's interesting, when you get the seventh trumpet, you have another picture of the end. And, and to me, it, it becomes very clear because something very interesting is said, Joel, uh, is before you get to chapter 11, verses 15, you know, through, through 19 there, you get to chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. And then we, we hear that uh, when the seventh angel is about to sound, that would be the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God will be finished as he's declared to his servants, the prophets. So he lets them know a mystery is going to be finished, which he's declared to his servants, the prophets. Well, keep in mind, the saints are waiting how long until you avenge our blood? Well, wait until your brethren are killed. So things are going to go down with your brethren. But also, it's interesting, he says, the mystery of God will be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. When you look at uh, Revelation or, or Paul in Ephesians 3, you have the Church of the Mystery mentioned three times. And the mystery there is the Gentiles... Uh, uh, being incorporated among the Jews as God's people. Uh, and he calls this the church of the mystery and this mystery that's been hidden from long ago. Uh, and he points out that it's been declared by the prophets, but it wasn't clearly revealed. It's a mystery, a mysterion, right? Uh, and then you see that again in Revelation or Ephesians 5, you know, I behold it, you know, or not, we're not behold yet, right? But we're at, uh, I tell you, you know, he talks about the mystery uh, of Christ in the church, the mysterion. And there's this mystery of the church made up of Jews and Gentiles, with Israel also killed, having their own identity to agree still nationally until the very end, and then into the New Jerusalem. But then it's interesting in Romans 16, he talks about the mystery. He says, uh, and Paul, by the way, in 3.6, I think is in Ephesians, back to Ephesians, he says, to be specific, I'm talking about the Gentiles being incorporated in God's people. In chapter 16, he, Paul talks about this mystery, which is preached to all nations to bring the obedience of faith. In chapter 11, now it gets a little more clear what he's talking about. He talks about... Uh, the mystery he talks about the uh, mystery i would not have you be un uninformed i like the king james there for our, for our replacement theology friends uh do not be ignorant okay god's not done with israel he would not have them be uninformed about the mystery that hardening has happened to israel in part until and this is important until the fullness of the gentiles has come in so there's this mystery that he we see in romans 16 especially as well where it's declared through the prophets in the past this is important because he's talking about the mystery of the church coming together. And then in chapter, I think it's chapter 11, verse 25, Joel, right after he talks about the fullness of Gentiles coming. And then that's where he says the deliverer will come on, come from Zion and, and, and turn ungodliness from Jacob. That's tied into the second coming, the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. And, and that's, hold, that's what's holding the, the whole thing up, right? And then when you get back to Revelation now, let's go back to Revelation chapter, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 10. In the voice of the seventh angel, when he begins to sound, seventh trumpet the mystery of god will be finished as he's declared to his servants the prophets they're waiting for this mystery to be finished and what does it look like when it's all finished 
Last Gentile comes to Christ and Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, all of us, Gentiles and Jewish believers, but we shall be changed, right? In a moment, the twinkling of the eye, the last trumpet. At the last trumpet, that's when it's going to take place. All of us are going to be changed together as one. And then when you go to uh, chapter uh, uh, 11 and you look at the seventh trumpet. Now, if we go to the seventh trumpet and we find a plague of grasshoppers or we find something that doesn't make sense, then well, this whole understanding is off. But Paul said at the last trumpet, and this is so important because, of course, in Matthew 24, 29 through 31, any trumpets before that trumpet blows and the electric cut couldn't be the last trumpet. But I tell my pre wrath brethren, you suffer from the same problems our pre trib brethren suffer for. We, we're able to go just specifically to these passages and say, just believe what it says. Well, when you get to the last trumpet, something fascinating happens. Uh, you get, guess what? Uh, the Lord returns. Uh, by the way, it's interesting because the dead in Christ rise first. And just before it actually says it blew, you see the two witnesses lying dead for three and a half days. Boom, they're caught up. They're dead in Christ. That's interesting. The seventh trumpet blows, and it says, and, and, and I encourage my pre wrath brethren to realize that this is also a picture of the end, because it says, he took his great power and began to reign, and he reigned forever and ever. You know, that doesn't happen until Revelation 19 when he comes back, but it's a picture of that. And it says, uh, he came, he destroyed those who are destroying the earth. It's very, very important that we see that. And it also says, he who was and who is. And not who is to come, because he's done come right there. And then when we read in Revelation chapter 22, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Revelation 11, the seventh trumpet blows. It's time to reward his saints. I mean, it all ties into the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, the reward in the saints, the destruction of the wicked, the fullness of the Gentiles coming in, and the mystery of God being finished. And I'll say just one more thing, and then I'll take a breath, Joel, because I'm interested to hear your response. When you go to the uh, seventh uh bowl you see the same thing so i'm saying it really looks to me like the sixth seal seventh bowl and seventh seventh trumpet and the seventh bowl all bring you to the end and uh and what i would do personally is when the fifth seal starts uh, and you see when they're crying out to god and that's open uh then when you open the sixth seal you see a quick answer to that is and then the seventh uh seal is that seal is just popping the whole book open now you have a scroll you have one it's just hanging there as soon as that opens up it opens up and then you get all the details of what he's going to do in protecting the saints and and the and the trumpets and the bowls and so forth but i personally believe that the sev the first trumpet blows right after the first seal because that the seals where the prayers go up right in the fifth seal and then the chapter 8 you have the prayers going forth and then it's a longer answer versus this quicker answer in the sixth seal and I'd encourage people to put this on slow a little bit, maybe. And I know they probably do that with you sometimes. Just listen a couple of times because it'll start to sink in. Because to me, it's so beautiful. But then when you get to the seventh bowl, uh, it's interesting because verse 15 of chapter 16, you know, you know, behold, I come like a thief. Well, wait a minute. Did you already come like a thief at the sixth seal? Yeah, he pretty much did. But the sixth seal is the seventh trumpet is the seventh bowl. So why is he coming like a thief? And he talks about Armageddon in verse 16. Get battles together in the battle of Armageddon. And verse before that, you know, for verse before verse 15, the three spirits like frogs come out and so forth, gathering the kings of the earth. So there's this battle of Armageddon, and he's coming like a thief in light of Armageddon, which is Revelation 19. And then what happens? You have, by the way, I should be mentioning this, but we're, I know we're covering a lot. You have the earthquakes with the sixth seal, seventh trumpet, seventh bowl. You have the cosmic disturbances. You have uh, the stars falling and the Greek words asteros. It doesn't have to mean literal stars. And the, both the seventh trumpet and the seventh bowl, you have hail and sixth or seventh bowl gives you actually the weight of about 100 pounds each. You have the same cosmic things taking place and the same huge earthquake. And by the way, the sixth seal, man, the, 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 in every mountain and every island, going back to the fifth, first seal, is moved out of its place. That's why it says, who can be able to stand? That's the end. Seventh trumpet's the end. You know, he destroys those who are destroying the earth, and he begins his reign there. Seventh ball, which I think is interesting. And now look at this in light of how long, that, pr that first prayer, how long until you avenge our servants, you know, our our, 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 your, 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 uh, our fellow brethren and us, you know. Uh, and that's that prayer. And then he shows the answer with the sixth seal. And then he shows the an answer with the seventh trumpet and the things that lead up to it. Well, and, it, and he gets this kind of finality. In the when the seventh angel sounds, it will be finished. Well, that's the answer to that prayer. How long is it going to take until this happens? It'll be when the seventh. I'm sorry, when the seventh trumpet uh, blows, it'll be finished. And you have that same kind of language, Joel, when you get to chapter 16, verse 15, and then the blowing of the. Uh, I'm sorry, the pouring out of the seventh bowl. You have uh, 
it says it is done. <laughs> There's this great earthquake, you know, and again, you see the Lord, you know, Babylon is just utterly destroyed, you know, and the Lord begins his reign. And, and most people will agree the seventh bowl is the end, you know, so you don't really have to debate that. So I honestly think what Alan says is the hardest part for post-tribs to get over is one of the most beautiful, powerful things in scripture that shows that the end is at the very end. So I think there's a lot of irony there. And by the way, if that's the best you got, and I think it favors the post-trib view, uh, we have all these clear scriptures that show the end is at the end, the same ending bring, that brings deliverance to the saints, the same ending that brings uh, judgment to the wicked. And there's not a separation where it's like, oh, he came back and then th they're mourning. Where did he go for a year and a half, you know? And, you know, I love my pre-wrath brethren. And you know what? Hey, guess what? I could go up pre-wrath in the rapture with them uh, a year and a half earlier, and I'll say, praise the Lord, you're right. And and I can say to them, if you're wrong, praise the Lord, you're still, you still understood your face, Patrick Christ, and praise the Lord, no big deal, man. This is Link Shields, praise the Lord, he gave us his, his truth. It's our pre-trib brethren that I'm super concerned about, because many of them, and I give a lot of, a lot of examples, Joel, uh, in my talk when I debate Dr. Stauffer in the, what's so called the great debate, because at the end, the last question was, why does it really matter, you know? And I gave several quotes, starting with Tim LaHaye and others, uh, where Tim LaHaye says, if he doesn't come to pre-trib rapture, the hope is blasted. We, the, the second, it's a blasted hope. And I show many pre-tribs say that God's evil if we have to go through the tribulation, uh, I, that, 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 that I can't serve a God like that. They're already being conditioned to not serve God if they have to go through the tribulation. And that the prosperity teaching, I mean, that's a whole different thing, but the church has been so fattened up for the slaughter. I like to call it a recipe for apostasy. Doctrines that say you won't go through the tribulation. If you go through the tribulation, don't worry, you can't fall away. It's impossible to fall away. And by the way, if you take the mark of the beast, you know, you can still be saved after that. That's all be, that's become popular teaching. Aside from post-millennialism and preterism and everything else that doesn't leave the church ready. So I praise the Lord for what you're doing. And I hope I didn't talk too fast, but praise the Lord. No, thank you so much, Pastor Joe. Um, yeah, everybody can go back. I don't know if there's a button to listen on like three quarters, you know, I'll be like, welcome everyone to Pastor Joseph. <laughs> you can sit down with your notes and, and go through everything. But so essentially <clears throat> what you're saying is that the book of Revelation is frequently recapitulatory. It's it's reviewing the same general story from different angles, different perspectives, telling it using different imagery and different symbolism, but it is recapitulatory and it shouldn't be understood in a a very rigid, strict, um, consecutive view. And if we take that perspective, it just actually becomes rather confusing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even my pre-wrath brethren would have to concede that there's the second coming is mentioned several times throughout Revelation. And they wouldn't say every event after it's mentioned actually takes place. They would have to, you know, and the example I gave was verses uh, 15 through 20, Revelation 14, very clearly Armageddon, you know. But then the bowls happen after that, and they would say, well, they would have to at that point say, yeah, that's a picture of the end. Well, the sixth uh, seal looks like a picture of the end as well. Yeah. So the way that I um, probably try to articulate it is, you know, I always joke and I say, ironically, when I got saved, you know, I was a big pothead, acid freak. Um, and ironically, the first thing that I did was open up the Bible and read the book of Revelation. Well, you talk about a recipe for something. I mean, that was a recipe for confusion. Um, <laughs> no actually, I still have the Bible here that I was reading just before I got saved. And there's actually ashes in between the pages because I was getting high as I was reading the book of Revelation. But um, so I, I often say that our view of the end times, um, it should not be revelation centric what i mean by that is to say the bible already lays out the timeline and the template for the end times throughout the old testament and then of course we get a lot more in the olivet discourse in the new testament but when you get to the book of revelation because i think this is what a lot of christians do is they start with the book of revelation and they form their theology and their timeline from the book and then they try to retroactively go back and make Daniel and the various prophets fit with their very revelation centric timeline. Whereas the reality is, you know, the Bible was revealed in a particular order and our timeline should primarily already be formed and fashioned. Even before we get to the new Testament, Jesus brings clarity to it. 
And the book of Revelation is really kind of, as you said, it's a series of pictures, a, a series of snapshots. And this, um, this explanation may not sit well with a lot of our audience, but, um, you know, I, as an artist, as someone I've been in the, the field of art for so many years, I've read, and I actually have a real affinity for sort of like Byzantine, ancient Christian art and iconography and this sort of thing. And so when you actually read about the philosophy between, again, historical Christian iconography, and I know this sounds weird, but like, for example, with icons of John the Baptist, um, he'll often be holding a basket with his own head. So he's standing there, you know, making some Christian gang sign or whatever, and he's holding his own head. And you go, well, that's not like he wasn't walking around carrying his own head, but that's intended to convey a spiritual reality, a picture that throughout John the Baptist's ministry, his future martyrdom, that was part of his ministry. That was actually part of his message. That was his calling that he always carried with him. And so it's hard to describe what that is. Again, it's a it's a spiritual snapshot. And you see all, all this these symbols often in, in the icons, and some of them are a little bit spooky, and some of them are, are actually very inspiring. But in a sense, the book of Revelation is very similar. Um, so let's say Revelation 19, you've got this, I mean, unarguably the quintessential picture of the return of Jesus in the whole New Testament. But it's not just as though John had a vision of the actual event. I mean, there's a sword coming out of his mouth. Um, you know, again, that sounds like something out of an acid trip. He's got King of Kings and Lord of Lords written. Is it tattooed on his thigh? Like, that's not literal. Um, he's, his robes are soaked in blood. You know, that's an illusion. It's harking back to Isaiah 63 when he crushes his enemies like grapes, stomps them, stomps the winepress of the wrath of God Almighty. Well, how is he coming back from heaven already soaked in the blood of his enemies? So I don't see Revelation 19 as a literal vision of the actual return. I see it as a prophetic picture, a spiritual symbolic picture of his return, drawing from all of this Old Testament imagery. And really, in many ways, I see so much of the book of Revelation like that. So if we understand the book that way, then it's actually much easier from my perspective, to see it as you just described, which is it it's telling the same story multiple times using different images and symbols, and these tend to overlap. Um, if we if we try to read it as though it's a rigid timeline, then I certainly understand the pre-wrath um, you know, argument and criticism. They go, you have to first open the seals, and then after that is the trumpets, and they really emphasize the the essential importance of having this consecutive um, seals, trumpets, bowls, but I personally don't have any problem at all as seeing them as being recapitulatory and, as you said, um, overlapping. So here's my question to you, um, because I know that there have been a handful of academics that were post-trib um, that have written books or studies and commentaries. Off the top of your head, do you know anyone who has written who really highlights and discusses these these parallels, like the commonalities between the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl, and some of these type of things? Do you know? Are there any studies for people who really want to dig into that? I wish I could point you to a study. I know that most scholars, uh, and not that we go with most scholars, because uh, but most scholars in the Book of Revelation uh, tend to agree that there's recapitulation. Uh, most exegetes that actually write commentaries, they'll admit that there's a, a fair amount of recapitulation. Uh, Gundry, I think from a post-trib perspective, uh, he talks about, uh, I don't think he goes in any detail, but in his book, The Church and the Tribulation, and then I don't know if he covers it in First Antichrist, but uh, that's the first time I'd seen it mentioned in my studies and when I was reading The Church and the Tribulation, which is a very good academic book on it. But he mentions a recapitulation there and so forth. And he may uh, talk about the sixth seal, seventh trumpet, and seventh bowl being the same. But if he does, it's maybe in a paragraph or two. Okay. Uh, I've developed my viewpoint through teaching through the, memorizing a lot of the book of Revelation and then uh, teaching through it two different times. Uh, so I've had time to, uh, in fact, brother, before I came on with you, 
You know, I was going through these passages and it seems like there's always more fruit that's yielded when you meditate on scripture. And I've looked at these scriptures so often and it hit me like a ton of bricks, you know, uh, the mystery of God. I already understood the mystery of God being finished at the seventh trumpet as to be the mystery that God reveals through the New Testament, which is Paul's main mystery over and over again, that the saints will all be gathered together, Jew and Gentile in one body. Uh, but it hit me like a ton of bricks. That's still an answer to that prayer. How long would you avenge our blood? He's wait till your brethren are killed like you are. You're still waiting for them. So I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe you and I have to co-author something on that, bro. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. But uh, but I, I think that, you know, uh, I, I think that, and I don't say, and I think it's important because I don't want to make anybody misunderstand. I know I already corrected this, but just in case, we're not saying, look at the first seal. It's the first trumpet and it's the first bowl. They're all the same. When we're, we're, we still believe, I believe, and I think you believe as well, that the, the seals happen sequentially, you know, and then then also the trumpets happen sequentially and the bowls happen sequentially. It's just, I believe, the seal, since the last uh, sixth seal, not seventh, the seventh seal just opens up the, the whole book, That uh, this, but where do they happen in relation to one another? And I believe since you have the prayers of the saints and the, and the fifth seal, the sixth seal shows the very end. But then when you go to chapter eight and their prayers of the saints are going up again, and now you have this slow march to Armageddon, that it's wise to put to see the first uh, uh, the, uh, the beginning of Revelation eight uh, as on par with or with the fifth seal in Revelation chapter six, because then the trumpets go and they lead up to what happens at the sixth seal and the seventh trumpet and the seventh bowl. So I personally see it as five seals. Then all of a sudden, uh, then when actually in actual time, what happens? Keep in mind, John's opening this. And Jesus is opening the seal, and so they can see the whole scroll. So why wouldn't there be pictures of things that happen, you know, that aren't chronological? There definitely are, and almost everybody admits that. But uh, then the whole scroll opens. It makes sense that when that seventh one's popped, now you get to see all the details, which is exactly what you see now before the end. So to me, there's a, a, a beauty to it, especially when you have how long, fifth seal, and then the end. And then you have the mystery will be finished, you know, the seventh trumpet. And then the seventh bowl, it is done. Yeah, that language is very, very interesting, cohesively tying these the sixth seal, seventh trumpet, and seventh bowl together, and the fact that he's answering the prayer of the saints to begin with, and they're all rescued and so forth. And even the seventh bowl, he, they're warned, I come like a thief, you know, lest he that, you know, uh, keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and people see his shame, you know. Uh, so I think the symmetry, it's actually the sixth seal, seventh trumpet, seventh bowl gave me, I already love the book of Revelation. It brought my love to it, Joel. Just like, just like, wow, God, you know, it's just amazing how you just tie all these things together. And then you start to see, and, and Joel, it's easy for you to see this, I believe, because uh, one of the things I've loved about your ministry and your heart is you are ready, you, you're open, but you're, you're like, okay, wait, you know, you're able to look at and, and see the parallelism. You've seen that in your own ministry and brought it out many times. So it, it, it'd be no wonder that that would, it would make sense to you, but uh, for, but I will say this. I've taught on this before because I've gone through Book of Revelation, as I've mentioned more than once, and uh, and it is a little confusing at first, you know. Uh, but you know, Paul wrote how Peter Peter wrote how Paul wrote some things hard to understand. You can't go to the Book of Revelation and just say, okay, I just got to read it straight through. That's exactly how it happens. Otherwise, you have Armageddon several times, you know. But uh, what, but God calls us to study to show ourselves approved and to rightfully divide the word of truth and compare spiritual things with spiritual things. So if you take it slow and you say, okay, what's going on here? And when you get to the sixth seal, you say, wait a minute, the sky, the, the sky is rolling up like a scroll and the stars are falling from heaven. And every mountain and island's moved out of its place. And who will be able to stand? And, and the great day of his wrath has come. That sounds a lot like Revelation 19. In fact, it sounds like the second part of the Revelation 19, not when Jesus just comes and they see him on the horse. But it, it sounds like the second part where the beast is taken with him, the false prophet. Their leaders are just decimated and they take off and say, crush us, hide us from the wrath of the lamb, you know. Another thing that actually popped in my head when you were talking, um, because in a sense, another one of the strengths of the post-trib view are the many weaknesses of the pre-wrath view. Um, in that, so for example, and I don't want to elaborate on this too much, but um, in my opinion, it's really difficult to place the two witnesses in the first half 
of the final seven years. And I believe Alan Kirshner holds that they prophesy during the second half. To me, it's really hard to get around that they prophesy in the second half. However, it specifically says they prophesy for 1,260 days. So you assume that that very specific number correlates to the final 1,260 days. But if that's the case, then you have them dying on the very same day as the Antichrist. And you do, as you said, end up with the first resurrection, part A, part B. You know, you end up with multiple first <laughs> resurrections because if the pre-wrath perspective is true, the church is resurrected back here, the, the two witnesses are not resurrected until later. And are they not in Christ? And then you have the peoples of the earth giving away candy and celebrating for three days. Well, one of the common pre-wrath arguments is they'll say, um, well, how could it be that people are being married and given in marriage if, you know, meteorites and locusts and fire and all this stuff's being poured out? That's impossible. That's ridiculous. I go, but you guys believe that they're going to be celebrating and giving gifts three days after the death of the Antichrist. Like that's, you know what I'm saying? So you, you, yeah. if you really determined to have a lot of these um, rigid, this rigid chronology, you actually run into tons of problems. And it's easy, by the way, let me just say this. It's easy to fault find. It's easy to criticize. It's easy to find problems. Um, and, and so I don't want to make it all about that, but they are significant problems. So um, let me just say this too. If somebody wanted to, find um your teaching now that's a big ask because as you said you've got 14 years <laughs> 14 years of working through the but where do they go to find if they want to dig in more to some of the stuff that you've done okay first i'd like to direct them to something you did which i think is so important right now uh you talked about the sharing of gifts when the two witnesses are killed mm -hmm. and it's interesting because uh muslims don't only, they only behead people like revelation talks about but they send gifts to each other after they strap a bomb on a little kid and blow up a bunch of people. And uh, and I think it's very interesting. I really encourage people to check out your book, The Coming Antichrist. The Coming, I think it's Islamic Antichrist. or uh, Islamic Antichrist, yeah. Man, you guys got to get that. If you have not read that, especially with the times going on, you need to read that. That blessed me so much, Joel. And uh, I just think that's such an important book. Uh, but I would say they could go to uh, Good Fight Ministries on YouTube. And they'll see a lot of our podcasts that take place. Uh, we deal with a lot of contemporary issues that are taking place from a biblical perspective and so forth. And uh, they could go to uh, Blessed Oak Chapel a website, or I'm sorry, on YouTube as well and hear messages. But uh, we have goodfight.org is our website and so forth. And uh, But I, I deal with prophecy. I, I can't get, get away from it, kind of like you, Joel. <laughs> I believe God just stamped it on our hearts to deal with these things. Uh, and I emphasize a lot, continuing the faith and so forth. And and to the point where people are hearing that a lot, but I go through scripture verse by verse often and sometimes a lot of times topical things as well. So, uh, but I think it's important too to keep in mind with regard to what you just said in Revelation 18, when you're talking about, hey, how can, you know, the world's going to be saying peace and safety before the sudden destruction comes upon them. In Revelation 18, 6, that's when he says, come out of my people, out of Babylon, lest you partake of her sins and of her plagues. And that's right before the second coming. It's right before Babylon is destroyed. So it seems as though uh, there are believers that are still uh, in jeopardy if they don't get right. And they get, you know, like like it says in Luke chapter 21, they get overcome by the, the cares and the fears of this world and so forth. So it's not as rigid as people want to make it as far as it's just horrific everywhere all at once. If, if You know, there yeah. are times where believers can get actually caught up in the world and, and you know, be in serious trouble. And actually... You know, another interesting point there, because I've actually never thought about that, is it's a glaring problem with the pre-trib view. You've got saints throughout the tribulation, and they go, well, those are tribulation saints that got saved after the rapture. But the pre-wrath view actually has the same problem, because they let's say they say we got raptured a year before the return of Jesus. Well, then you've got believers. So you would actually have to call those from a pre-wrath perspective, wrath believers. Yeah, Absolutely. And for our pre-trip friends, uh, they want to, uh, the saints, the word saints is used throughout scripture, Hagias, you know, of, of Christians, of believers, Gentile believers. You can apply it to Jews. You should, during the tribulation period, there'll be Jewish believers and it's, they'll be converted at the end for the most part, Israel. But it's interesting when you look at, when it talks about the bride being made ready, 
and they say all oh, the churches that mentioned in, in the book of Revelation from these, you know, chapter, you know, four on it until, you know, later after the tribulation. No, that's not true. 19, right before Jesus comes, it says his bride will be made ready. But it says when it's been given to cleanse her, or I'm sorry, to, to clothe her with the uh, these this white apparel, which he says, which is the righteousness of the saints. So saints are identified as the bride, which is obviously the church. The bride is never, it's, it's used of the church throughout the New Testament. Also, when uh, after the millennium, when Satan's unbound, you know, for uh, after the thousand years, he goes make war against the Jews and the Gentiles who are reigning with Christ. And he call, it says it against the saints. So Jews and Gentile believers are called saints twice in the book of Revelation. We know it refers twice at least to the church. So when you read, he'll persecute the saints. And that comes on the heels, as you know, uh, Joel, uh, Revelation 13, it says that he'll, you know, uh, persecute the saints. It says, he'll, you know, then he'll be beheaded. Those that are going to captivity, going to captivity. Those that be killed the sword, will be killed the sword, and so forth. And he talks about he'll reign for 42 months and he'll overcome the saints. But right before that, in Revelation chapter 12, the woman is hiding in the wilderness. The Lord's protecting her for 1260 days. And then, uh, and then it says in verse 17, the end of Revelation 12, that the dragon has great wrath and he comes after those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And keep the commandments of God. And that's the next reference about what any people group looks like before you read the word saints. So I don't believe the Lord says, oh, divorce your, your this because of this later preacher rapture through is coming up and just make it, you know, discontinuity. And by the way, since I mentioned the 1260, uh, the days, when you read the early church fathers, uh, they don't have those days being cut short. They under, didn't understand that uh, the tribulation be cut short as meaning into the week, uh, shortening the week. Uh, when they mention, and sometimes and it's beautiful when we talk to preterists, we're able to show, hey, look, the early church fathers, man, they didn't look at, hey, Nero was the Antichrist. And no, they look at these 10 nations. It can't even be Rome because 10, the, Irenaeus says, these, you know, uh, these that Rome has to give way to the 10 nation confederacy. And, but God's given us the number of the beasts, he says, so we'll know how to avoid him when he comes. Definitely post-trib, definitely a futurist. But they also, he also talks about that last week, you know, that, that 70th week and how it'll be divided. That's what we believe. That's what the early church believed. But they talk about that last, you know, 1290 days and they don't talk about it being shortened. They talk about that's, you know, after that is when the Messiah will come. So we're on really good church history ground uh, when it comes to our theology. And we don't say, hey, we got it right. We just say we say this and we labor this point because we want others to see, hey, there's a lot gonna ha going to happen. And the more we can understand about the times, I like the sons of Issachar it says they knew what to do because they understood the times and and there's great application for our brothers and sisters in Christ. When we understand the times, we have clarity, especially because the end times will be characterized by mass confusion, even in the church, you know? Yeah. Yep. The Lord is going to shake everything that can be shaken. Um, he's going, judgment begins in the house of God. And I personally believe that shaking is already beginning. And um, we need to absolutely be ready for the chaos. So listen, Joe, I know you've got another appointment here in about 15 minutes or so. Just want to thank you so much for coming on. Again, thank you for your heart. Um, I'll put up the link to Good Fight Ministries on the site so people can um, follow through that and, and track with you and so forth. But um, yeah, thanks for the good fight. Thanks for keeping up the good fight, for being consistent throughout these years, especially in your part of the world. Um You've got the California accent. I've lost my Boston accent. <laughs> we, we could have uh, we could have played with that a bit. Like, whoa, Joe, that sounds wicked hard. It sounds like those days are going to be so hard, Joe. You're like, yeah, in the bro. car, Hobbit in the garage, and uh, what's the car? I got a friend that's got the Boston accent when he wants to. Hey, yeah, Joe, I love you, bro. I praise God for you as my brother. I praise God for all my brothers and sisters in Christ, pre-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's keep discussing these issues. I praise God for, you've been such a light and I just uh, praise God for your ministry and praise God because a lot of people, your audience that are, are uh, have, are, I've learned a lot from you. Uh, keep him in prayer. Keep us all in prayer. And I uh, just uh, want to give thanks for you, brother. All right. Awesome, Joe. Thanks again so much for your time. You have a blessed day and I'll get this together and uh, send it to you and we'll talk soon. Okay, God bless you. Talk to you again. Okay, Appreciate blessings you. to y'all. And for the rest of you all watching, God bless you all. Have a great week in Maranatha.